hello again. This is Dr. Jay Smith here in United States, and I'm coming to you with two friends. Now, you know these two friends. We've had them on before. You will see Mel, Mel from Sneakers Corner. Hi, good to have you back again, uh, Mel. Great to be back, Jay. We've, uh, we've been putting up quite a few of your videos, and looks like you're getting a great response, and it's lovely to see that you're actually engaging with the people on the comment section at the bottom. Well done. Thanks for doing that, Mel. And then we have our good friend Murad from the Middle East. Sheikh Murad, how are you? Hello, Dr. Smith. Uh, thank you for having me once again. Well, it's too bad that we can't show your face. And the reason why, folks, is for security reasons. And uh, Murad was a former Muslim, and so therefore, for security reasons, we don't show his identity uh, because you, you all know what happens to former Muslims uh, when they go public, especially if they are critical of Islam, and especially if they are critical at the material that we are introducing today. Because what we're doing, and as you all well may remember, we're going back to the seventh century, we're always coming back to the seventh century, trying to keep away from the ninth and 10th century, which is the only narrative we've been able to use because that's the only one that Islam has ever given us. That's the only one we've been provided. That's the only one that's taught us. That's the only one that all of you who are watching have heard. And so we're saying because they're so late, because they're so far away, because they are so full of errors, historical errors concerning what really happened in the seventh century, we need to go back to the seventh century. And we're doing that today. And the topic for today is the Hijrah. Now, I'm going to let Murad do an awful lot of introduction to this, but for those of you who don't know what the Hijrah means, it means exodus. It means movement from one place to another. And it's well known that this is the, what we have been told from the 9th and 10th century, what we have been told is that this is the movement by Muhammad in 622 AD from Mecca to Medina, moving from Mecca to Medina with about 80, some could be as many as 200 followers. And that would be the beginning of the Hijri calendar. The Hijri calendar, uh, whenever you see a Muslim give a date with A-H next to it, that is after Hijri. That is from 622. That's the year that the movement happened. That's the year that the, uh, the Islamic calendar begins. And that's what we're going to question today. Because we're not so sure that the Hijra ever took place. We're not even sure that there is such a th uh, an exodus between two cities called Mecca and Medina. Now, uh, you've already heard Mel go on and talk quite a bit about how that much of what we're finding about the 7th century is not at all even from that area, Mecca and Medina. That's the Hijaz. It's not from that area. It's much, much further north. You've also heard our good friend, Dan Gibson, uh, who talks about how that much of the pre-Islamic material is Nabataean. So we're talking there about Jordan, and now we're moving over to Iraq, and there's going to be some new material that Mel is going to be introducing next week, it looks like. Uh, about Mecca itself. But let's uh, go back to the Hijra and let's go back to this event that supposedly that happened in 622. And I'm going to give it over then to Sheikh Murad. If you can go ahead and bring up your PowerPoint, let's go into your PowerPoint. Uh, so I'm going to let Murad speak and then both uh, Mel and I are going to sit back as armchair watchers, we're going to be looking at and listening to what he says. We're going to be following like you, and then we're going to interject our opinions. I've asked Mel to come on board so that he can also uh, add to the discussion. Uh, as Murad goes and introduces the material, listen to it, watch what he's saying, think about it, and then comment at the bottom. You know, right below this video, there is that whole comment section. Do comment, and both Mel and myself, but mostly Mel and, and Murad, will be looking at your comments, and we will probably do a Q&A period where, we'll, where we will respond to your comments. So, Murad, over to you. Okay, so now we have the Hijra, and the question is, is it a reality or is it a myth? Some people say AH means after Hijra, but other people can say it means Augustus Heraclius. But this is not part of the discussion. What we are saying is we want to find, did the Hijra even happen? Now, this video is composed of five segments. First thing is, did the Hijra happen? Why exactly the year 622? Who did Ibn Ishaq model his Hijra upon? Is it a Hijra or is it moon worship? And then finally, we will look at a new timeline without the Hijra. Part one, did the Hijra happen? Now, before we answer that, we have to look at some facts first. 
First, there is no mention of a migration of the Prophet Muhammad from Mecca, Saudi Arabia, to Medina, Saudi Arabia, in any contemporary source outside of the Islamic tradition. I got this from Robert Hoyland, uh, seeing Islam as others saw it. We do not find that. We simply don't. There are, in fact, a few sources that contradict the Islamic narrative of the Hijra. An example would be the Chronicle of Theophanies, which has Muhammad going from Medina, Saudi Arabia, all the way to Jerusalem and going up back and forth. He says he went up, he made plunder, he went down unharmed. And this is a Byzantine source. It contradicts what we know. Now, the Quran doesn't mention the Prophet I Muhammad. Just there real quickly, Murad. Do you know the dates for Theophanies? It's uh, 800s, it's 9th century. It's a little too late also. Okay, so this is actually before, however, Ibn Hisham, this would be before the Hadith and the Sira. Exactly, he, compared to the Islamic narrative, he is a little older. Now the Quran doesn't mention Prophet Muhammad's Hijrah from Mecca to Medina. Only the commentaries do, and the exegesis, they are the ones who do this. But if you read the Quran, uh, and, and you just read it, you will not get this idea at all. Now, the Islamic tradition does not give enough details on the Hijra. Where did the Prophet rest? How long was the journey? How hot was the sun? Unlike the biblical Exodus, where you can find the dates and you can find the names and everything. Despite the fact that the Islamic tradition is filled with other less important details. You can find anything about the Islamic tradition, what the Prophet liked to eat and all that stuff. But the Hijra, where did they camp? Where did they sit? What happened? None. Now the criteria that we will use, how did the early Muslims view the Hijra? Did they even hear about it? Did they even mention it? The Islamic coins, the archeology, span and the caliph documents are the best place to start. We will start with how Muawiyah, one which is the first, viewed the Hijra. He is the first Umayyad caliph. How did he see this? Now we have a Muawiyah inscription. This is at Hammamat Gidara, and it lies seven kilos east of the southern end of the Sea of Galilee. It's in Syria. It's in Golan, Syria, and its date is 42 AH or 663 CE, and the source is Islamic awareness. Now, this is the original inscription, and it's in Greek. This is the inscription, and we have to see that it starts with a cross. This is like a, a crusader cross. This is short, and all the ends are equal. Then you have the name here. Ma'avia. This is the Greek way of writing it. And it sounds like uh, Queen Mawia. If people know that she was uh, an Arabian Saracen queen way before Islam came to the scene. Now, what is the translation of this inscription? Starts with a cross and says, In the days of the servant of God, Mu'awiyah, Abdullah Mu'awiyah, the commander of the faithful, Amir al Mu'minin, the hot bath of the people that were saved and rebuilt by Abdullah, son of uh, Abu Simu, it might be Abu Asim, the governor of the fifth month of December, on the second day of the week, in the sixth year of the indiction, in the year 726 of the colony, the Arabic colony. According to the Arabs, it says according to the Arabs, Kata Arabas the 42nd year for the healing of the sick under the care of Ayunais, uh, the official of Gidara. Even the word Gidara, it became Arabized as Gidar. We know this means the wall. Now, what is significant about this? The inscription is ignorant and it's not aware about the Hijra date and uses the term according to the Arabs. Why if this date is so significant in the Islamic traditions? So Muawiyah is not aware 
about the Hijr date used according to the Arabs. Okay. And I want to ask Dr. Smith. There. When it says uh, in the year 726 of the colony, I presume it's referring to the, the Greek calendar there, followed by the Arab calendar. Yes, the 726 has nothing to do with the Islamic year. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me just say one thing, though. That would be significant right there, Murad, because what you're doing is you're putting two different dates side by side. You're talking about one referring to the Greek call and the other one referring to the Arab. If this had been Islamic, they would have certainly put Hijra because that would be their defining, that would be their defining term for the dates. The fact that Hijra is not there and it's the year of the Arabs proves that this is much more significant. So I would say that, that, that really supports your case pretty clearly. I, I would also point out the fact that the Arab date is secondary to the, to the, the first one would suggest that it's a vassal state to the Byzantines rather than a state in its own right. So it doesn't look like, a, a, you know, what the later tradition paints it to be, which is like a completely independent caliphate. It looks like it's, it's not standing on its own feet just quite yet. Yeah, and fascinating because both of these points confront the Islamic traditions of the 9th and 10th century. The inscription is ignorant, and it's not aware about the Hijra date. It uses the term according to the Arabs. Why, if this date is so significant in the Islamic traditions, Muawiyah didn't use it. Muawiyah himself never said Hijri. Why? So this is the first point. Now we have another piece of evidence, and this comes from the numismatics, which means the coins. It comes from Abdullah ibn Zubair. So here we are talking about the other side. When, of course, the later Abdullah ibn Zubair, he had a fight with Abdul Malik, an opposing rebel to the Umayyads. Now we have this coin here, and this is the first coin struck to have the name Muhammad. It's in year 66 AH, or Arabic, after Hijra. It's from 6. Uh, 85 to 686 and it has here Muhammad Rasulullah it was struck by Abdul Malik Ibn Abdullah Ibn Kriz under, under uh, Abdullah Ibn Zubair this is the governor, this is not the other Abdul Malik, this is a governor under Ibn Zubair beside the date we have this phrase a very intriguing phrase it says 66 بعدم قضاء أمر المؤمنين this is the formula beside the date 66, not Hijri. After the believers, case has been settled. This is what's on the coin. It doesn't say Hijra. And this in itself will, will have us uh, investigate a new theory. Who are the believers and what case has, been, has it been settled? So now, if we look at the timeline, we do not see a Hijra. We see here in this year 622, uh, 662, sorry, 663, we have this Greek inscription by Muawiyah, says, according to the, to the Arabs. Then in the year 685 or 686, we have this coin says, after the believer's case has been settled. And we don't know when did the Muslims start writing Hijri beside the date. So all these early Muslims, these Umayyads, they don't know about the Hijra. They are ignorant about it. Now we have extra evidence. All the Umayyad and the Abbasid coins and artifacts, I have looked at almost all of them. They do not mention anything about the Hijra and never write Hijri beside the date as we do today. They, all, they, e they either leave it like 66, they just leave it like that, or they say Arabic, 66, Arabic, Arabi. Now, if some parts of the Quran was revealed to Muhammad in Mecca and somewhere in Medina, why didn't the early Muslims put it in that order? According to the revelation, why did it never happen? Probably because it was a later invention. 
That's why we have the Quran in this order. And I will get back to you, Dr. Smith and Mel. Well, what what you're saying here is like we have BC and AD before Christ and Adil Damno after Christ. Why don't they have before Medina, after Mecca, Medina, or before uh, Hijra or after Hijra? Since these are two, since the two parts of the Quran, one, the first, the, the, the second part of the Quran is from 610 to 622. That would be before Hijra. The second, the first part of the Quran, uh, which is about the first 20 chapters, would be after Hijra, A-H. That's what you're referring to there. No, I, I want to say that uh, we have the Quran in the wrong order. Why doesn't the Quran start with Iqra? Why didn't the, the early Muslim community put it in that order? I think the only reason is because the concept of the hijra is a later invention and it was way too late for them to reorder the surahs because the people got used to that you see okay i mean the, I, I can hear i can know the comeback on that muslims will say listen everybody knows that it's not to do with after or before hijra it's all to do with length of surahs so the sm the largest ones are first the smallest ones are second, outside of the first one, the first, uh, the Fatiha. All of them go by size, not by date. Well, uh, I can come back on that because when I tried to look at this, I saw that it's not, um, the, the first one is not the largest. You can find that there are other ones larger than the ones before. So they are oh, not yeah, actually I, the going fatiha, by size. The, the Fatiha is, is a case all of itself because most would have, uh, most scholars would say the Fatiha was added at a much later date. But from Surah 2 up until Surah 20, those are all diminishing in size. And then from after that, they diminish even more so. There are some exceptions to the rule. You are correct. But that's how they would, I, I can see that's how they would defend it. They're not really looking at AH or after AH. Yes, but naming, but naming the Surahs in itself is a new invention. So right. this case, it, it just gets dropped because it's, all, it's already a new invention. So I'm saying, why did the people in the early days, they didn't put it in that order? Yep. I have no other explanation because the only thing it means that there was no Quran revealed either in Mecca or Medina. It doesn't go this way. There is no good reason to have it in this weird order. Okay. So now the verdict, looking at just what we looked at, since the Hijrah, which means the migration of the Prophet from Mecca to Medina, is never mentioned in the archaeology, so you never find anything in Saudi Arabia about this, and numismatics or early Islamic documents, nor the contemporary sources, nor any hostile source from the 7th century, and not even in the Quran. It stands to reason that the Hijra never happened. And I will come back to you, Dr. Smith and Mel. I want to know what you think. No, I, I, I don't know what you think about this, Mel. I mean, this is a pretty strong argument right there. Now, of course, the comeback will be, well, this is argument from silence. The difficulty is, and what we've always been saying is, it is an argument from silence, but the silence is now on the foot, is, is, is going to be on the foot of the Muslims. They've got to show now that there is a Hijra if, if anything, this idea of the Hijra, since there's nothing to support it anywhere in the 7th century, they are arguing from silence. Because if it's that important, and it is important, because the entire calendar is dependent on this, uh, on this one act, this one event that goes from Mecca to Medina, 622. If that is the case, then I would suggest for Muslims, or rather than saying that we're arguing from silence, I would suggest they are arguing from silence. What do you think, Mel? Yeah, I think the, the idea that essentially a retreat was the basis to, as the start of Islam is not a very good reason. Um, I think the idea that there was some form of confederation that united different tribes, such as the, the uh, Gasnets and the Lakhmets, is a much more convincing reason and seems more based in reality than this mythological idea of a a migration. So I think it smacks of a mythology straight off and there's also so many biblical echoes in terms of the exodus and things like that that I would straight away think that it's suspiciously like 
um, a redaction that was done in order to um, make the story more dramatic, perhaps, and maybe to myth mytholo uh, mythologize. mythologize this story. Um, so, um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it as being very historically reliable. What, what is interesting, you. Mel and Murad, is this reference to Year of the Arab. And I think, Murad, you're going to say something more about that. You're going to zero in on that. And I think that also fits with what Mel has been finding, that there is something significant about 622, uh, with the Lachmids and the Ghassanids coming together against the Byzantines and the Persians, and this Arab identity coming to the fore starting in 622, uh, which would make sense then if you're trying to put a history together and you are the, uh, you are the beneficiary of that Arab rebellion, you're going to then go back to that date as the significant date. How you're going to then, uh, how you're going to then spin it or the significance you're going to give to it is what the later Islamic traditions have done with it. They foist and put it all on the shoulders of Muhammad, this man Muhammad. But what Mel is finding out and what um, I think Murad you're going to talk about, it has nothing to do with one man significantly. It has more to do with a whole race of people that are coming and carry and are throwing off the control that has been with on top of them for so long. And that's why that date is more significant. But let's go ahead and let's find out if the, this is uh, just, going. There's one other thing I'd like to just throw in, if I may. Um, if you can imagine that the Abbasids were trying to get rid of the early history, which, which basically s suggested that Islam started up in the north, one of the big problems, one of the big gaping holes in the in the narrative is the fact that it was between the Ghassanids and the Lachmids joining. So that's the problem. They need to cover up that story and give a different twist. So by creating this hijra between Mecca and Medina, you have a foundation story, but you don't have any reference to the Lachmids and the Ghassanids. So you, so it allows you to create a new narrative way down in the Hijaz. But if you don't have that story there, there's that gaping hole that will lead to questions being asked. So I think it's a useful device to cover up the early history that they don't want people to know about, I think. Well, uh, I just want to come back to the idea of arguing from silence. It's not arguing from silence because silence in itself is not a big problem. Maybe we will find the evidence tomorrow. The problem is we have a few contradicting uh, sources like that of Theophanes, putting Muhammad from Yathrib, Saudi Arabia, all the way to Jerusalem. So this is a big problem. This is not just arguing from silence. Now, no, in fact, we, two, we have the evidence. It's the Islamic traditions that don't have the evidence anymore. And so it's completely switched the argument from silence away from us and back onto Islam. Exactly. Now, the year 622, why is it significant? And I just put here Heraclius so that people are ready to see uh, the role of Heraclius, the Byzantine emperor who was alive during the time of uh, Prophet Muhammad. If we want to know why, we should ask the Quran. Now, the Quran sides with Rome, and this is a little bit controversial, but uh, we will see the comments. What do people think? This verse is from Surah 30, and it's verses from 2 to 6. It says, the Romans have been defeated in the nearest land, but they, after their defeat, will overcome within a few years. Of course, people say this is uh, from 3 to 9, but this is a fraud. They do this so that they tailor it. It's just bid'ah in Arabic. It means a few years. To Allah belongs the command before and after. And that day, the believers will rejoice by the victory of Allah. He gives victory to whom he wills, and he is the exalted in might, the merciful. It is the promise of Allah. Allah does not fail in his promise, but most of the people do not know. It, it's important to uh, exegete Surah 30. It is one of the things that uh, most people don't look at it closely. The Quran says the Romans had been defeated in the nearest land. True, this is called the Sasanian conquest of Jerusalem. The Sasanian Empire, which is Persia, 
conquered Jerusalem after a brief siege in 614 during the Byzantine Sassanian War of 602 628. These wars are very critical, people should know about them. Now, the Quran says, but they after their defeat will overcome within a few years. Yes, this is known as Heraclius campaign of 622. This is if people wanna Google this. The Heraclius campaign of 622 AD, erroneously also known as the Battle of Esos, was a major campaign in the Byzantine Sassanian War of 602-628 by Emperor Heraclius that culminated in a crushing Byzantine victory in Anatolia. So the Quran is accurate here because it's written after the fact. Now we have the Battle of Nainawa or Nineveh. It's in 627. This was the climax. It was the last battle between the Byzantine and Sassanians. The Byzantine victory re later resulted in a civil war in Persia and for a period of time restored the Eastern Roman Empire to its ancient boundaries in the Middle East. The Sassanian civil war significantly weakened the Sassanian Empire. Actually, the, the Sassanian Empire went into civil war and uh, new research is suggesting not that it was civil war, but it was Sassanian against the old Parthian uh, dynasty, the old Parthians. And this is another research. This led to the Islamic conquest of Persia later. Now, under the peace treaty, the Byzantines regained all their lost territories, their captured soldiers, a war <coughs> indemnity, and a great and of great uh, spiritual significance, the true cross. Heraclius got back to Jerusalem the true cross <clears throat> that the Persians stole. It was lost after uh, Jerusalem was in the uh, Sassanian hands. This was the last conflict between Rome and Persia. This is a fresco in uh, the Middle Ages depicting the Battle of Nainawa. Now coming back to the Quran, it says, to Allah belongs the command before and after. And that day the believers will rejoice by the victory of Allah. Why will the believers rejoice? Why are the believers happy about Byzantium winning against Persia? Now if we remember the first coin with the name Muhammad, it had this formula. After the believer's case has been settled, now it makes sense. The believer's case has been settled after Heraclius crushed the Sassanian Empire and gave the Arab Christians their independent state. These were the Ghassanids and Lachmids. This is the coin, of course. For more on the significance of the year 622 and what actually happened, this is the best book to start. It's The Hidden Origins of Islam, and it's the part by Volker Pop, the famous German numismatic. And these pages from 17 to 39, and now I want to know your opinion. I think it's a, an excellent explanation for what happened. I wasn't aware of some of those details, so that, you know, it's really good. I think it makes good sense in light of the surah. So what's your Dr. point? Jay, what do you think? Yeah, I think this is important. Go back, let's go back the slide before, before you get into this slide here. Don't, don't move to the next slide. I think it's important what you are doing here, Murad, is you're looking and you're asking, let's look at these verses in light of what's happened historically on the ground. Let's don't just try to impose on them what the later narratives are saying. And you're saying, if you look and see that what was going on, the ground of the war between the Byzantines and Assassinate, you have the Arabs who are watching this from the sidelines, of course they would rejoice. Why? Because the, the, Byzant the Byzantines are now taking out and eradicating the oppressors who have been oppressing them for all these decades. And, in some cases, possibly centuries. So it's, it stands to reason that they would rejoice at this period. And that would then all the more make it significant why 622 is so important. 622 is now important because this is when it all began. And if that is the case, then we now, instead of always taking what the traditions have said concerning chapter 30, uh, Surah 30, we need to look and see what history is telling us. 
and history is giving us a much more correct story. Why? Because it's giving us a story from within that century, which is what, as a historian, you are a historian, you're doing. Well done. Okay, so the, the part three, we have, who did Ibn Ishaq model the Hijra on? Now, a little background on Ibn Ishaq. Uh, he is the guy that the second Abbasid Caliph, al Ma'mun, he asked him to write a biography of Muhammad. And this, we have the first biography from this guy. We do not have the origin. It's lost. Then we have his student, al bakai It's also lost. Then other, uh, then Ibn Hisham, the original, is lost. We only have a copy of Ibn Hisham. This is how we have uh, the biography of Muhammad. <laughs> Can I interject right there? Remember what Mel just said about five minutes ago. Much of everything that, has, that, that, that came about after the Abbasids take control, and the Abbasids are up in the Persian area, up in Baghdad. That's where their headquarters are. They moved their headquarters to Baghdad. Remember, the U Umayyads before them were way up in Damascus. So they moved their headquarters over to where they come from, in Baghdad. And what do they do? They want to eradicate anything that has to do with the Umayyads. So what do you do? You eradicate and you destroy the, all the history that has gone on before that does not support your own narrative. Now can you understand, and we've been saying this for years, but I never really thought it through until Mel and you, Murad, have come up now with this evidence. I've always thought, why is it they waited so long? Why is it they take 200 years to write down this biography of their prophet Muhammad? And why is it they don't use Ibn Ishaq? He's closer to the event. His date is 765. Ibn Hisham that you're referring to only writes his material down in 833. That's the ninth century. That's another, that's around another four, uh, 70 years later. So what's going on here? Why so, why so late? Well, you can see why they are, they are trying. This is called censorship. This is called censorship. We even get this referred to when we're talking about Al-Buhari. He's given 600,000 of these, these traditions, these akhbars, and he's to throw out that which, are not, that which are not relevant. So what does he do? He whittles them down and throws out 98% and only keeps out of the 600,000, 7,397 or 7,400. That's it. 2%. He only keeps 2%. What, what are the other 98%? Well, you guys have just said what the other 98% is. It's everything that has to do with history. They threw out all the historical material. They threw out everything that had to do with the 7th and 8th century. They only come into power until the mid-8th century. And anything that has to do with the Umayyads, anything that has to do with what's happening up in Damascus, anything that's happening to do with uh, those who come before the, uh, them, they throw it all out and then write their own narrative. And that's why it doesn't, it takes another, well, after Ibn Ishaq, he had an awful lot of, of uh, well, I would suggest he had an awful lot of historical facts that were not just not usable. So when Ibn Ishaq takes and writes what he does, he throws out what, Ibn, what he doesn't like at Ibn Ishaq, only retains what he liked. When Al-Buhari comes, another, we're talking about another 40 years later in 870, he then throws out 98% of everything that he doesn't like and only keeps that 2%. So everything we're dependent on, on what this man Muhammad said, is only 2% of what was actually there. 2%, I would suggest, is a very little amount. I would love to see the 98%. It looks like we're getting back to that 98%, because we're going back now to that period. We're going back to those people. We're going back to these events. We're going back to those documents. We're going back also to the coins. And what you're doing here is looking at some of the material specifically zeroing in on the hijrah. Love it. This is good stuff. Yes. Uh, now we have the Chinese source. I didn't include it in here, but Mel talked about in the last video. And it says that the Tashi or the Ta'i in Arabic, they changed the narrative around 758. 758 is exactly the time when the second Abbasid Caliph asked Ibn Ishaq to start writing the biography. It's uh, the second Caliph is called Abu Ga'far al-Mansur. Now the Hijra was it an Abbasid propaganda. The Abbasid Caliph al-Mansur built the house of wisdom and transmitted other texts. This is in the Islamic tradition. I'm not making this up. The Bible was one of them. Now, if you want to take a whole library and translate it, maybe you take uh, books about magic and stuff, but you also take the Bible because there are a lot of Christians and Jews there. You have to know their language. 
Khalif al Mansur asked Ibn Ishaq to write him a biography of the Arabian Prophet Muhammad for his son. This is the Islamic tradition saying this. Ibn Ishaq did so by looking into the Bible, trying to make Muhammad have similar characteristics with all biblical prophets. Now, how do I know this? Uh, Mel made a very good video in Sneakers Corner channel looking at how Ibn Ishaq actually copied everything from the Bible, but in a very weird way. Also, the genealogy, it's the same as he took it from Jesus Christ. In fact, I would say he copied it so much, you can almost see him with the, the Bible open on one side as he's writing it, because he literally just took the ideas and then just turned it into his own spin. Exactly, and, uh, and uh, the light coming out of Amina, the Prophet Muhammad's mother and all this stuff, it it's comes from the Bible, but in a very twisted way. Now, after reading a prophet like Moses, and all these verses from the Old Testament that Nadir Ahmad uses, he used this same thing. He attributed an exodus to Muhammad as Moses. The reason is persecution for being a monotheist. And even Dan Gibson, he noticed how uh, the Islamic tradition always does this parallel between Muhammad and Moses. And even when you watch Nadir Ahmad in the debates, he always says, Muhammad is like Moses. He's exactly like him. Well, yes, but it was made up. Now he named it Hijra, and it was modeled on Hagar, hence Hajarines. Actually, if you add a, a dagger alif in the word Hijri, it becomes Hajari, it becomes a Hajarine. Entering Medina is the rehash of Jesus entering Jerusalem. Now, how do I know this? Because there is a poem that is used even in the English movie by Mustafa Al-Aqqad, which is uh, uh, about the Prophet Muhammad. I, I forgot the name of the movie. Very famous movie, very nicely done, and it gets the poem inside it. This poem was actually in Syriac, and it refers to Jesus Christ. It's a variation on Hosanna. Now, who was the, the Hijra modeled upon? Muhammad was abused for calling for monotheism like Moses. He fled from Mecca to Medina like Moses when he went out of Egypt. He entered Medina on a donkey like Jesus when he entered into Jerusalem. So this is how it was done. Go ahead, Mel, why don't you start? Yeah, it, it looks like they have taken tropes from the Bible and use them to build a story for Muhammad, which is there to big up Muhammad, make him greater than he was. So they're taking a historical core, perhaps a real person maybe from the early days, but, but he's not exciting enough. He needs to be bigger and brighter. And so what do they need to do? They need to make him more like um, Moses. So they take similar ideas from the Bible and they plant it onto to Muhammad, it makes perfect sense. Dr. Andy Bannister did his doctoral thesis on looking at these, uh, uh, what they call um, narratives, these oral stories, these oral narrations. And uh, he did whole graphs where you can look and see. If you look at the Quran, you look at these oral stories, formula, you'll see the formula. He calls them formulaic orality. And when you look at the formulas, they all are pretty much the same formula all the way through. Story after story has exactly the same theme. If you're copying from the biblical material, as Ibn Yisak is doing, then what you're doing is you're taking these formulas and you're referring to the, the original one. You just add a little bit here or add a little bit there, but they all have the same, they, they all have the same pattern. And th what's fascinating, this one now fits if there is, if they have the Bible in front of them, as you're saying, Mel, and they keep the Bible in front of them, then you can see that not only the story of Muhammad, but almost all the stories of all the prophets follow the same formula, Sam follow the same narration. It fits to the pattern. This we've already seen. You're just now supporting what we've already known. Yes. So now for part four, we want to know, is this a hijra or is it a moon worship? Now, the Hijri calendar is simply a lunar calendar. The Quran commands its readers to fast Ramadan when they see the crescent moon. Now, the word shahr in Arabic, it means month. 
but in Aramaic, it simply means crescent moon. And there are very few rare English translations which has this word as crescent moon. Muslims today cite the moon to start the Ramadan fast. The crescent moon is a symbol over all mosques today. They don't have any other symbol. This is the ancient Babylonian god with the crescent moon. And of course, uh, I know some people don't know this, but I am the one who came up with the, with the Iraq idea that Islam started there. There is a video on Sneakers yeah. Corner where I said, where was Mecca? And I, I put forth two uh, theories. One that Mecca maybe was in Iraq, another maybe it was in Central Asia. So this goes well that with the Iraq thesis and with the Iraq hypothesis. This is a statue of Allah. It was found somewhere in Arabia, and you have here the crescent moon on his chest, and the way he does his hands, this is like the Muslims do today. So was it a hijra or is it some sort of moon worship? What do you think? Yeah, um, just something that springs to mind. Marwan II, who was the caliph in the middle of, let me get this right, the eighth century, his palace was built in Haran on the site of the old moon uh, god, um, Yassin. Mm. And uh, so it's interesting that the caliph chose to um, build it on the ruins of an ancient uh, site yes, that was seen. dedicated to the moon god, Se yes, Seen. Seen, seen yeah. on its own is the crescent moon. Yassin, it means all crescent moon. And it's in the Quran, actually. Yeah. The word Yassin. Do you want me to go on? Yeah, go ahead. I'm not going to comment on this right yet. I know that a lot of people have come up and have come back and saying that th there is, that much of what we're now hearing is, much we know about Allah and all that is the moon god. Is that what you're, is this what they're getting it from? The same, the same reference that you're, re that you're referring to here? Yes, almost yes. Of course, what, what I just, just to make a, a, a disclaimer here, Many people believe that the moon that we have in the star that they have on the Islamic flags today is that moon god. Just so people are not, uh, don't get confused, the moon in the crescent, the crescent moon and also the star that you find on the present day flags is not at all to do with the, this moon god because those were introduced by the Ottomans after the 13th century, much, much, much later. That is a political symbol. So just so you don't have that confusion. Some people have said yes, but on the coins, and we've looked at the coins where you have the crescent and the star on the coins, that is also a Sassanian symbol. That was a pre-Islamic symbol that existed in the coins all the way up from the second century AD up until the time of Mu'awiyah, because he has it on his coins as well to begin with uh, there in 661 up until 680. Yes, exactly. Now, can we have a new timeline without a hijra? We, are, we have seen now that uh, the Hijra doesn't appear in any literature, and it maybe never happened. Now this is the old timeline again. We only have Muawiyah saying according to the Arabs, and it's, his inscription is in Greek. So the first Umayyad Caliph doesn't know the Hijra. Then we have the first coin with Muhammad, and it's all the way in Iran, and it says after the believer's case has been settled. Again, no Hijra. And we don't know when did the Muslims use Hijra. Now let's revise this. Let's make a new timeline with the new data and let's see what will come up. Now, before 622, Arabs wanted Heraclius to win against Zoroastrian Persia because the Zoroastrians at this time, uh, they were very hard against the Arab Christians. And this we can see from other books people who look deep into this, but I didn't go very deep inside the timeline because it will be a whole new video. Can I just say as well that there was also a motivation among some Persians, particularly those connected with the Parthians, to want to join in with that against the Sasanians because the Sasanians were so unpopular. 
Yes, but this is a very long story, Mel. This is yeah. this could be a video on its own yeah, about yeah. the Parthian conspiracy to drop the house of Iran. This is a whole new video. Yeah. So yes, the Parthian noble team, maybe they wanted that also. Now by 622, Heraclius started the campaign of 622. That's if you want to search it on Google, that's its name. It was the major Byzantine counterattack against the house of Sasan, against Persia. Now in 628, after the battle of Nainawa, the true cross returned. Heraclius then dissolves the Foderati, which are the Ghassanids. It was the state that he used to pay for them so that they keep everything uh, in place. Heraclius, when he returned the true cross, he went to Jerusalem, he took off his, cho his shoes and went barefoot and then returned the true cross and he saw himself something like a savior or something. Now, it's very interesting that the Islamic tradition says that Prophet Muhammad sent Heraclius the letter right after he got to Jerusalem and got back the true cross. But we will see what actually happened. We have the migration from Arabia and Iraq into Damascus. That's what started happening. Not a single person, not Muhammad moving. They were the Arabs moving from Arabia and by Arabia actually, I mean Arabia as, as Rome saw it. It was a small part. It had nothing to do with the Hejaz. Arabia means modern Jordan and a place in Syria, the, uh, a desert in Syria. And it's the place where the, the um, ISIS uh, keeps staying at. I don't know how they like this place, maybe. Yes? Um, next to Raqqa. Uh, yes, was Raqqa. Called... So it's what you're saying really Rilkan. is this is much, much, much further north, which is what we've been, this, this is almost getting repetitive, isn't it? We keep on reminding people that all of this area of Arabia is, does not include the Hadramat in southern part of Arabia, does not include the Hijaz, the central part of Arabia. It's all much, much, much further north. And that's where everything seems to always be pointing to, coming back again, moving up this migration from Arabia, that would be the northern part which would include Raqqa, you're right, but they're going and they're moving back to Damascus, which is at the northern part of Arabia. Yes, because you see the Romans, they knew about these places because they, they would definitely want to raid them if there was something there. So they knew that the lower part of Arabia was called Arabia Felix, that is the Yemen, and the, the northern, northern part, this is what they called Arabia, and the part in the middle is called Arabia Deserta. So it means the desert. It, no one wants to go there. There is no one there. There is no one there. There is no history there. That's why it's yeah. fascinating that we can't find any archaeology from there. We can't even find the right Arabic from there. So, I mean, it's all, it, again, we, we seem to be saying, we seem to be coming to the same conclusions over and over and over again. Just the word Arabia deserta it literally means abandoned Arabia. So it, it actually holds the meaning that there's no population there, which totally undermines the whole Islamic narrative. The whole that, Islamic narrative, which starts from the premise that Adam and Eve were sent there, starts from the Islamic, uh, uh, the Quranic reference in chapter uh, 21, that Abraham lived there. Can you see, that's 1900 BC. And when you look at the traditions that all the, all the trade, north, south, and east, west, were all centered on Mecca and Medina, that this was the center of all trade. Yet there's nothing in all the trade routes. Look at all the maps. There's no reference to this city or that uh, trade that went there. The only trade that Patricia Corona found when she did all her work on, is on uh, Meccan trade and the rise of Islam, that major book that came out in the 1980s. When she looked at that, the only trade that she could find, even in that part of the world, was up on the plateau uh, that went started in Aden, going up to Nazar and the Sana, up to Taif, went up to Yathra, then Tabuk, then Khaybar, then on up to Gaza in the north. That was only trade with, with which was leather and with milk. There was no significant trade other than that. All the significant trade went up the Red Sea. So can you see, it was nothing more than desert. It was nothing more than that really uh, unpopulated land, could not even accommodate the regular trade route. And so when you stop and think, when you're going, we're talking about the seventh century now. It isn't until the eighth century that it's even listed. And you're going to talk more about that next week, Mel. And that is the reference to it. The earliest reference we have, even to this city called Mecca, doesn't come till 741, proving that this is nothing more than wasteland. 
Absolutely. Yes, and also if, uh, if this was the place of Abraham, why didn't the Jews or the Christians ever want to raid this place and try to take back the home of Abraham? <laughs> they never well, thought about it because it's a hoax. It's a hoax. It would be so significant for the Jews. It would be so significant for us because we also go back to Abraham. Why, would, how, why is it we never even hear about Abraham anywhere but 600 miles further north? Exactly. So now we have, coming back to the timeline, we have an Arab independence. This is what happened. This is the major thing that happened. And Volker Pop in the, uh, in the book that I mentioned earlier, Hidden Origins of Islam, he mentions this. So I got it from him. Now Muawiyah came to power at 661. Just two years after him becoming the caliph, Muawiyah dates his inscription according to the Arabs. He never says Hijri or A-H. He doesn't say that. He says according to the Arabs. And uh, of course we said that this starts with a cross. Something that Islam today doesn't really like. But Muawiyah was okay with it. Then a few years later, Still, we don't have Hijrah. We have after the believer's case has been settled. This is on the coin minted in Iran under Abdullah ibn Zubair. Then in the 8th century, we have the Abbasids creating the Hijrah myth through Ibn Ishaq in the 8th century. And actually, the Chinese source gives a, it's almost a slam dunk, like Mel says, that the Abbasids changed their own history. Absolutely. So now if we have a Muslim and a non-Muslim, the non-Muslim has all the right to say, it is your turn to prove that the Hijra happened and the ball is in your court. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> That's great. Well done, Murad. Listen, uh, I, I, uh, one thing I love to do, and I want to get left, Mel, if you have any last words to say, I'm just going to do a quick review of what Murad has done here. I like to do this with both Mel and Murad uh, so that we can, we can help the, the viewers really go with it. So go ahead, Mel, why don't you have something to say, and then I'll end, up, I'll end this up. I think, um, Murad, you, you've made a very compelling case that the Hydra was a later redaction back to maybe to cover the tracks so that the Abbasids could support their own claim to power. Um, I think the, the reference to Ibn Isaac and you know, the use of biblical troughs was a very good one. Um, I like to your use of um, archeology span and numismatics. I think you've built a really strong case. And uh, I wouldn't like to be a, a member of the Dawa team trying to defend their, their side against uh, your uh, assault, let's call it that. <laughs> Well, listen, let's, let's go. Let me just re reiterate what, what I have picked up from what you've said. Now, both Mel and I, we're, we're new to this. We're just, we're just hearing it for the first time. And so this is my, my take on what you've brought, Murad. And I want to thank you for this. You've done a great job. And what you're doing is you're doing what every historian should do. You're taking, you're looking, and you're saying, I have difficulty. If, there is, if this hijra is that significant, if all, of our, if all the Muslim calendar is dependent on this, this hijra, then where is it in the historical evidence? Where is there any historical evidence for this place called, or this, this action, this um, exodus that goes between two cities? It just doesn't exist. It doesn't exist for a very good reason. And that is that when you look at the historical context from the seventh century, there's no reference to it in any of the inscriptions. Uh, we have, you, you gave the reference to Theophanes, who's writing be, in the 800s, so he's writing before Ibn Hisham, he's writing before Al-Buhari, when we do get the references to the Hijrah, he's predating them. And he talks about this, this event that's happening way up in Jerusalem. If that's the case, then you're, you're again, you're, you're over 600 miles too far north. So even the, the location is wrong. The fact that it's not in the Quran is absolutely significant. Uh, that's fascinating to me. I find it, you know, Muslims are always trying to use the Quran to support and uh, to support what Muhammad did here, there, and the, uh, and the other. And we've already gone through this, Murad, where you went through in the four references to Muhammad could possibly not even refer to him at all. But what's fascinating, that there, if the Hijrah is that important, why is, there no, why is there no reference at all until the ninth century for this event? It's not in the Quran. And the Islamic traditions are the only ones that give it, but they give the, the Islamic traditions give us the wrong references, the wrong place, and the wrong time.
Now, you, you start with the, the Hamat Gader Pools, the inscription that's there from Mu'awiya, uh, between, he's writing between 662 to 663, and he refers back to the year of the Arabs. So he's referring back uh, 42 years to the year of Ar Arabs, which would put it to 622. But why didn't he use Hijab? If he was one of the first Muslims, and of course the Islamic tradition say that he was the first caliph, the Umayyad caliphate, so he'd be one of the strongest Muslims, why would he not refer to this? Why is there no reference on any of his coins, which do refer to dates of this Hijrah, this date uh, that goes back to this Exodus? Nothing. So that's significant. Uh, you look at the coins, and you notice that the coins uh, refer to this reference after the believer's case has been settled. Again, that should be after Hijrah. A H, but it's not there. There is no reference on any coins, and you've looked at all the coins. Bless you for doing that. There's no reference any coins for this reference to Hijrah. And then you zero in on 622 itself, and you you say, well, what can we do with the Quran? Let's look at the Quran, and you go to chapter 30, verse 2 to 6, uh, where it talks about this battle between the Heraclius or the Byzantines. We now know it. We know it's Heraclius because we know the date, uh, and the Persians. And the fact that the Byzantines defeat the Persians in a few years. And you say, take a look and see when this happens. Well, take a look in the history. We need to look at the historical book. And the history tells us that it happens around 622 or, 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 or in that er period. And it's fascinating because when you, you then, you can see how the Arabs at that time rejoice for the fact that the Byzantines destroyed the Persians. Why? Because they wanted to get the, this yoke of the Persians off their, off their shoulders. Why is it that this is not referred to in the Quran? Because of the fact the Quran doesn't really understand this, but history understands it. If you look at the Quran through a historical framework and not the traditions, or not the tafsir that doesn't even come till the 10th century. Remember, the first tafsir that is written by Al-Dabri is, is 923. That's the 10th century. That's 300 years too late. Let's go back, and as you've done, Murad, let's see what was happening with Heraclius. Let's even give him a name, and let's see what the significance that is to the Christian Arabs. These are Christian Arabs. Why? Well, remember the inscription you just put up there. There's a cross on it. There's a Byzantine cross on it, proving that these are Christian. Sorry, a cross showing that these are Christians. And then you go to the biography of Muhammad. Can I, so. can I just, I'm sorry, I just want to add something, but uh, because some people can come to this. Uh, they say that uh, the Byzantines had been defeated, then they will triumph. Uh, Islam critiqued. He, he said that there is another reading which, which will put it in reverse. So the Byzantines were victorious, then they will be defeated. But I want to say that in the Arabic, it doesn't work well, this reading. So I side with the Hafs, because in Arabic you cannot say what the Warsh is saying. It's not correct. So I side with the Hafs on this one. Huff's got it correct. Okay, good fan. Yes. Thanks for doing that. You move into the biography itself, and you talk about Ibn Ishaq, who is the initial biographer, and you you say very clearly, and this is true, that we don't have anything from Ibn Ishaq. That's true, and we have to point out why is it we don't have anything from Ibn Ishaq? Why was that not retained? Well, then that's the million dollar question. That's the elephant in the room from all these discussions. Why was nothing retained from that time period? And Mel brings a very good point here, and he says the reason it's not retained is because it's the wrong material. It's got the wrong narrative. It's the narrative of the Umayyads. And remember, the Umayyads are now defeated. The Umayyads headquartered way up in Damascus, and the Abbasids headquartered over in Baghdad. They did not like each other. And when the Abbasids finally come to power in about 749, 750, what do they do? They censor, they eradicate, they throw out anything that has to do with that which has come earlier. That's what you always do. This is normal. You always eradicate that which you then su suppress and you supplant. And in this case, they have done that. They have eradicated. So by the time Ibn Hisham takes what Ibn Ishaq has written, he takes and leaves, throws out what he doesn't like and only retains what he likes. And what does he retain? Well, he retains all these stories of biblical care, biblical prophets. But take a look at those biblical prophets and you will see that Muhammad's story follows that biblical prophet. Am I, is this, am I getting this correct? It looks like that Muhammad has many of the same, the, much the same narrative, much like you find with Moses, and especially with Moses, because Moses has a hijrah, that means he has an exodus, taking the people from Egypt back to out of captivity. So therefore, Muhammad has a hijrah, taking the uh, people out of, in this case, coming from one city to the other. That's where the narratives, the Islamic traditions then make that and put and see the significance in that. So when you look at that, you will see over and over again, that there is one, you might say one, um, one aspect of the Bible to the other. You, you, uh, also that he 
not only that uh, he was abused for his monotheism, but also that he even came into Medina on a donkey, like Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. So these are three things that you just brought up. You could probably get an awful lot more. And that's what you would do when you were trying to model your prophet onto the earlier prophets, or in this case, because of the Byzantine power that's just up north, the greatest power of its day at that time, your biggest competitor. What do you do? You try to model your prophet on many of the things that their God, in other words, Jesus Christ did. And then you go to the name itself, Hijra, which you think comes from the word Hagar or the Hagarines. I think that some people will probably dispute with that. Let's see what the comeback is on that. And then you ask whether or not the Hijra, or is it the Hijra, or is it a moon worship? And you use the word uh, Shahar, um, the, the word for month in Arabic, but it's in Aramaic, it is the crescent moon, whether or not that is really what we're coming up with. Now, what I think is terrific in all of what you've done here, Murad, you're asking the questions that you need to ask. You're asking the historical questions from the time period that these events take place. And then you're saying, is there an agenda that's coming on later to try to take all this and try to make sense of it? And Mel, maybe you can come back on this. If this is a, 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 a working through of eradicating that which did happen, so you have your own story of your own prophet modeled on many of the biblical prophets, but then you have to have the story of this movement from one, uh, in uh, this case, from one place to another. Looking at Moses, could would that be the would that be the jump off point? Why do they even need to have a hijra? This is a question I would bring up. Why even need? Why do you even need to have this? Unless, of course, you've got to you've got to maintain that date. You've got to maintain that date. You've got to give significance to that date. Yeah, I you. would say uh, my view is that. The name Muhammad itself is a title that has messianic uh, connotations. So they they are viewing him as a sort of a messiah figure. So in order to build a messiah biography, they need to draw from the Old Testament. They need to give it some depth. And so the easiest uh, one to do would be to draw from Moses. And uh, that, that provides sort of the impression of deep sort of biblical roots to the story that would be very difficult just to create off the bat. It's very difficult to come up with something completely original. Um, and and uh, so there's an awful lot of borrowings that have gone on and they're probably depending on people not being aware of the biblical stories as well. Particularly when um, at a later stage, they, they're kind of panning the Bible essentially and uh, saying, well, you know, this comes obviously much later but the suggestion that the Bible is corrupted and now the Quran is the perfect word of uh, Allah um, makes it much easier to push this later narrative because the Muslims are not aware of the earlier stories. They're not aware that so many of the stories are allusion, allusions to, for example, Syriac stories and other, and other things like that. So it, it's, it's all part of a, a kind of a scheme, if you like, to hide the earlier history in order to push the later narrative. If the narrative there, if the later narrative is being introduced in the ninth century, 833, 835, 870, 875, 923. So that's ninth and 10th century. Those are the four major dates for the Islamic tradition, the Siddha, the Hadith, the Tafsir, and the Tahrid. Then I would suggest that what you're doing here is because by that time, Mecca is the sanctuary city. It's the sanctuary, it's where the Kaaba is. Once you've done, once you have Mecca, and then Medina would be the political capital of uh, uh, the, not political capital as far as Baghdad is concerned, but certainly it would be the significant capital for Muhammad. If you once you're pushing Muhammad as this this character that's going to supplant the person of Jesus Christ in Christianity, then you've got to give him a history. You've got to place him down there. So if you're going to place him down there, and you already have the date 622 significant for your history, and everybody knows about it, and you've been using it because that's where the Arabs finally have come into their own. Then can you then, for what I would suggest is happening here is that they are then redacting the story down to that place where Muhammad lived, that place where Muhammad lived. And they're, they've already got the narrative that he was persecuted, like Moses was persecuted. He was persecuted because he was in Mecca, because he came from the Qurayshi tribe, and he was not seen as a major, major player. And through that persecution, then he then has an exodus up to this other city, and there he then comes into his own, and he defeats those who persecuted him. Then he starts the calendar. Now you have a narrative that now fits what you're trying to introduce. And you, that by doing that, you're taking that which already existed, the 622 date, and the fact that the Arabs had created their identity at that time, and you're putting it to the man in his own place. 
what you then do, you eradicate and destroy everything that, that, that would go against that. And that's why you have, when you have Al-Buhari taking 600,000 down to 7,400, throwing out 98%. That's the 98% that uh, was probably the historic material that should have been retained. And this has been done right through history. We're doing it even today as we speak. Look and see what they're doing with our history here in the United States in this election year. They're trying to destroy anything that are statues and they're trying to destroy people or events that would, that would uh, bespoil that narrative. They want that narrative that we are a diverse culture and that we've always been a diverse culture. So if that's happening in 2020 and we're seeing it happening within a period of one year, or in this case, in a period of two months, can you imagine this would have taken, this would have been happening also during the time of uh, between the Umayyad and the Abbasid period. And then of course, later on when the traditions are finally written. Great stuff, love this. Murad, do you want to have any last say? Uh, I want to add something uh, to this Hijra uh, narrative. Uh, you see in, in Petra, they used to worship Moses at some point and they used to worship Aaron at some point. Now, there is an Egyptologist who is David Roll, who looked at uh, the Exodus and he revisits the Egyptian chronology and comes up with uh, new stuff. When he does everything, he comes to the point that Dushara maybe was Aaron. So now we are getting very close. They used to worship Moses. They used to worship Aaron. Now, if you want to make a prophet, he has to be very similar to these guys because uh, the audience is not Muslims. They were not very much Muslims, but they were Christians and Jews. So you want to make a prophet that sounds very much similar to their prophets so that, so that they can relate. That's the idea. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks so much. Hey, listen, this has been fun. This is just one more uh, stone that we're building on that foundation, looking and one thing we've always asked. That's why I'm wearing my green shirt. You notice I always wear a green shirt because we're talking about debunking the seventh century. And we're not debunking it for that sake, just because we want to debunk it. We're, ja we're demanding that, the, that Muslims start coming up with a little bit more support. As Murad said at the very last slide, the ball is now in your court. Muslims, you can't keep on saying this is argument from silence. No, this is not argument from silence. We're coming up with the evidence. We're coming up with reference after reference, data after data, inscription after inscription, building after building, we're coming up with evidence that points to the fact that this Islam that you're talking about, that you say happened in Mecca Medina, did not happen in Mecca Medina. There was no exodus between these two cities. It looks like that was something that was redacted back to the seventh century. We're going back to the back seventh century to support what we're saying. Now, you Muslims, the ball's in your court, you come back to the seventh century, and prove that there was a hijra between one city called Mecca and another city called Medina in the time of 622. Back to you, Muslims. Let's see how you respond. And please do try to respond. Don't just sit there and give us all kinds of platitudes or call us names or give us kind of a threat or say we don't know what we're talking about. Wait, folks, these are white papers that we are putting out. We are put, pushing the envelope. We are pushing forcing people to ask questions they've not asked before. But we do want to get to conclusions, and the best way to do that is to have these discussions. God bless you, uh, both Murad and Mel. Thank you for coming on board, Mel. Thanks, Murad, for all the work you're doing. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Thank you. This Thank you, Jay. Mel, Murad, and Jay. Over and out.